tell you from uh, running at and business group, we started um, when I took over probably, so, you know, four years ago or so, a small little um, Internet of Things group. Within three years, that was a billion dollar business. And so it's moving very fast. And I guess what I would say is, if I look at cell phones and iPads and even PCs, that were the big growth driver in wireless since when once the iPhone came out, so since 07. That's growth, at least in the domestically, has kind of stopped. Right now it's a lot of stealing back and forth between carriers. And yet, I believe most of us believe, at least I believe, that we're at the tip of the iceberg in terms of wireless because everything's going to be connected. So I, I give you, I'll give you just one small example, and it's changing their business models. I'll give you one small example. I was in uh, Chicago uh, with Jeff Immelt, the CEO of GE, and we had done a deal, and he wanted me to come up and talk to, it was about like a room like this, of his top customers about what he was doing and using AT&T to connect his devices worldwide. To him, it wasn't just about connecting. The, he could really care less, frankly, about the connection. He picked at and because we're global, and we had the global capability. He was changing the business model in this particular case on all of the things that he manufactures. And the example he gave me is on um, he's connecting, he pretty much has already done it, all his jet engines. As soon as they land, they put a huge amount of data out there, and it's really about the data and he's now using that data to change the business model of how he sells to airlines. So he used to try to sell those airlines maintenance contracts. Now he calls them up and says, I know this engine needs X, Y, and Z, or as folks do, you need to get that fixed right away. And they have the part there and fix it before often the airline even knows it. You talk about great service. Now that's just one little example. He's connecting everything that he manufactures that way. So the idea of connecting things to the internet, the make them better, you know, I think kind of happens without us knowing it. And I just remember the, the seminal event, if you will, for me was when I got my latest version of PowerPoint back in like the late 90s. And I clipped on ClickArt and it said, do you want to go see a bigger library of ClipArt on the internet? And I just looked at it and I went, that really is going to change things, right? Because now this thing that I used to buy that was here is now enabled in this whole new way. And, you know, I kind of liken that to I'm in Home Depot looking for LED light bulbs, and one of the light bulbs right up there is one that I can control with my iPhone. Now, it's too expensive, I'm not gonna buy it right now, but it's just happening. People are just gonna do it, and we're gonna be consumers of this without knowing it, right? This, you know, people have used the Internet of Things, and people go, what is that, right? Well, you're gonna, you're gonna be using it before you even know about it, or you probably already are, and you didn't know, right? So I think it just kind of happens. And you don't wave your hand and say, oh, it's all about the Internet of Things. You just go build products that sort of take advantage of that infrastructure. And as the costs come down, you can, you know, you can do those things. You go and look at the free storage that you can get. I mean, my, my mom was paying Carbonite and, you know, like 50 bucks a month for she had two gigabytes of data. And I was like, oh, my God, just go get a Google account. I'll set you up, put it in your, my document. She doesn't even know she's using it. And now she has a full backup with zero cost. So the models are just getting broken all over the place. And I think it goes back to kind of what you said. You know, if you're bringing people into your business model, you'd be able to monetize things differently than how other folks have thought about it in the past. And it's very, very disruptive when that happens. How do you think about uh, the creation of value, uh, both from um, those, those pieces that interest you? Um, and then how do you think about the world of, of competition to create value between various players? Let me go. Um, it's a very complex question because um, business models are shifting very fast out there. And they're changing every day. Somebody comes up with a new one that changes it and that you've got to react to that. So I'll, I'll take uh, the Starbucks one that Dan brought up. So I'm very familiar with that. Dealt with them all the way up to their CEO on that deal. at and used to have it. It was very much an infrastructure thing. Uh, frankly, it was we didn't really make a lot of money. We didn't make any money on it, really. So, but it was you know brand, et cetera. And um, Google has it now. Well, why does Google have it? Because it's not for Starbucks business model. All, their business model was cheap, you know, because they want to be able to 
pocket as much of your $3 coffee as they can, right? But they wanted to give you free internet to come in there. It's Google's business model that changed that because their business model is all about collecting data so they can serve you up better advertising. So Google went in there and offered it to them for free. <laughs> Wi-Fi for free, including the interconnection to all the stores, which is either fiber or cable modem or in some cases, you know, multiple DSLs. Oh. Now, you know, when we told, made sure that Facebook understood that, I mean, not Facebook, sorry, Starbucks understood that, that they were giving their data up around their customers to, to Google. And this is a, you guys will get a kick out of this. You know, HT is obviously an internet company. The Wi-Fi data that we have was all about bits in, bits out, how to manage it. The Wi-Fi data Google was collecting, we saw their system in all this process, was all about where you surfed and how you surfed and what you did and what sites you went and how long you did it. And they're using that to serve up better ads to you, they make more money. So I, I still, I'll never forget this, it tells you how fast business models change and people don't really understand them. When we told that to Starbucks, they go, you know, just kind of was kind of silent a little bit. What we heard, we heard this from a combination of Starbucks and Google. You know, they, they went back and renegotiated with Google and said they own the data. Yeah. And Google said, okay, that's fine. Just license it back to us. And they said, okay, you know, they made more money. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then they got free internet, plus they got paid for their data, but Google still using it. And it's a totally different business model. Google Fiber, same thing. They're collecting your data. They can do that. They've got, I wouldn't say a monopoly, but close monopoly on internet advertising, you know, through search. And, um, and it's very profitable to them to get more access, get more people on their network, and use that data to serve up advertising. A carrier has a very hard time competing with that, even if they collected the data. So business models are changing very, very fast. And they're going to continue to do that, continue to evolve. I see new ones. Uh, one of the things I'm doing now is working with startups, and I see new business models every single day and how they're thinking about disrupting a current player. Um, so I guess what I would, um, one thing I would highlight is is how we're trying to work with some of the more established um, access providers. So, um, you know, with our connectivity focus, um, in light of the fact that, you know, there are literally billions of people that live within network coverage today who aren't online, it presents a great opportunity for us to partner with mobile operators. And so one of the things we've done is we've created this, what we call internally, this on-ramp to the internet for first-time users where we're eliminating a couple of the big barriers to connectivity. One is uh, the cost of access um, by offering a set of free basic services. The second is um, overcoming the awareness barrier. Um, what we have found is that in you know, big parts of the planet, people just aren't even aware of what the internet is and why they'd want it and how it could provide utility and value in their lives. So what we've tried to do is, is, is take this concept where um, in the past, a lot of operators on their own would, would choose to zero rate Facebook, make that free to their end users because it was good for their business objectives. They would get more people online, maybe more people would buy smartphones or sign up for data plans. And we've expanded that concept to include a whole suite of sort of high utility services. So, um, you know, Google search results, Wikipedia content, weather information, um, local job listings, uh, health sites, education um, content. And uh, we've launched this now. The, we call it the Internet.org app in about eight different countries. And, um, and it, is, it is proving to bring more people online. Um, and working with the operator, as long as some portion of the newly connected go on to consume other content and services, it makes it a sustainable model for the operator. So we're really trying to do some work to kind of bridge the business models between, you know, what are sort of generally known as over-the-top players, um, which Facebook is considered, um, and the actual uh, network providers. Let's kind of talk about uh, this sort of clash of business models, if you will, be between an over-the-top player like a Facebook and uh, a carrier, which is more of an access and infra like physical infrastructure um, provider. Um, you know, so I guess what we would, and a few of us were talking about this earlier, what, what we would say is, first of all, we want to have an open dialogue on that topic. Um, and we want to talk about the differences and talk about the value that each is bringing. 
Um, today in the US, um, Facebook and Instagram together is about 25% of smartphone user screen time. And you know, so what does that mean? That means that more people buy smartphones because of services that we're developing. Um, it means that more people buy data from operators um, in order to consume some of those services. Um, our service is free to the end user. We don't put that hurdle up in front of them. Um, we have an ad-based business model. And, and so, you know, if there's a strong suggestion that we should somehow contribute to paying for the network, you know, if I wanted to be really provocative, I could apply that same logic and say, well, look, we invest billions of dollars of CapEx and OpEx every year into our data centers. Um, maybe we should allocate that cost out to the operators who are getting the benefit of that 25% screen time and selling their smartphones and, and data plans. Um, we, of course, don't go down that path, but you could see where you get in this interesting conversation about you know, how you bring these, these business models together. So, I mean, I, I presented the middle road thing because we have been looking at this for a long time, um, and, and it seems to be a good place for us to work together with operators. Um, you know, interestingly enough, in the, in the US, for example, we don't have this issue. It's not really, it, and it in some ways feels like it's a, it's a, like the operators have figured out the pricing. AT&T and Verizon have 50% EBITDA margins. Um, they seem to, they're making it work. In Europe and other places, it's a different story. And some of that is legacy around pricing. Some of it's legacy around what operators have paid for their spectrum licenses. Um, and, and so it's, it's a complex issue. Every time I hear this debate, it just kind of goes away. Because somebody's either has, a, 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 you know, is willing to do it and then drive the other people along or whatever. Like, I don't actually understand the nuances of it. But I will say, you know, it is getting paid for. Like, my cell phone's not free and my data plan's not free. And that's actually a big chunk of money for a lot of people. And similarly, my cable at home, with, you know, in my case, is through Comcast. It's like it's bundled into a service that, like, the minimum I'm paying is 100 bucks. So you've got, like, this fixed cost infrastructure. And they're getting a pretty good share of wallet. Like, I'm probably, you know, a couple hundred bucks a month in just digital access. So I think the money's there. It's just a question of who's going who's gonna to keep it, right? And if, if these over-the-top carriers are monetizing it via another mechanism, well, all that infrastructure and the bits traveling back and forth, I mean, I'm not going to pay Comcast uh, you know, as much as I do if I can't get to some provider in Seattle, right? It has to work that way for everybody's business model.